Good morning. Will you please join me for the call to worship? People of God, we come today to worship our God of many names. We worship God, the creator who made us and loves us unconditionally. Jesus, our redeemer, who calls on us to prove we are his disciples in all that we say and all that we do. And the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the one who sustains us, inspires us and revives us all. So rise now, church and body and spirit, and raise your voices in praise of our God. God, we thank you for this day, for we know that this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and we're glad to be in it. Be with us now on this Reformation Sunday as we come to worship, worship you through your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church on this wonderful Reformation Sunday. It's also known as Mardi Gras Sunday, Pancake Sunday. Um, that Sunday, can't think of all the other acronyms that go, but as we come into preparation for going into Lent this next week, um, I see everybody's got their beads on, which is a good thing, so we got some good church this morning. A few announcements before we go into worship today. After worship um, is our monthly brunch with the pastor up at Cafe Central um, at 1230. If you haven't let Mark know that you're going, please do so, so we can let them know how many to prepare for. So uh, join us after uh, worship at 1230 for brunch. This coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, as I mentioned. Um, we will be doing an Ash Wednesday service. We are doing it um, jointly with all of our uh, sister communities of faith, um, our friends at the Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church, the um, Presbyterian Church, I mean, just the whole, all of us. Um, but we are getting together and we will be at Prince of Peace Lutheran, which is up off of Howell um, on, um, it's like almost Howell and Holt. Um, but we will uh, worship at seven o'clock in their sanctuary on Ash Wednesday. So come join us also, um, weather permitting, as we've looked at the weather forecast this week. So hopefully we will have um, nice weather that we can at least have uh, Ash Wednesday worship. So join us on Wednesday. Also starting on Wednesday, 
We are starting our uh, 2023 Lenten Challenge offering like we do each year. Um, there are containers out in the narthex, so pick one up on your way out uh, this morning and just uh, join us for that challenge like we do every year. So whether you know, you're giving up a Starbucks or whatever, so whatever you were going to give up for your Starbucks, maybe put that in your container or whatever, or designate a set amount for the 40 days, and um, we will collect those on Palm Sunday, which is April the 2nd. Um, it also, you can also do it online as well this year. Um, in a couple of weeks, as our deadline for script orders for February, um, if you are ordering script, there are forms out of the Narthex. There are also forms online if you wish to uh, order that way, so um, or see a board member. Also in two weeks is our Pack the Pantry Sunday, where we collect non-perishable items for the folks over at Vivant Encourage to help keep their pantry stocked for those individuals who are less fortunate and are in need. So um, remember to bring your, your non-perishables. I can't get words out this morning, I'm sorry. Um, on the 26th uh, for that Sunday. And that's all the prayers I have, oh, excuse me, all the announcements I have for this morning. Um, also, just a reminder that this coming week, please watch your email and your mail, um, as I know the uh, capital campaign information is um, in the process of being sent out. So with that, let us hear God's word. Our Hebrew lesson comes from Exodus chapter 24, verses 12 through 18, taken from the Inclusive Bible. Then Yahweh said to Moses, <coughs> Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the law and the commandments, which I have inscribed on stone tablets for you to teach them with. So Moses and Joshua, his attendant, went up on the mountain of God, saying to the elders, Wait here for us until we return. Aaron and Hur will be with you. If there is dispute among you, turn to them. Then Moses went up the mountain to where the clouds engulfed it. The glory of Yahweh then came to dwell on Mount Sinai. The cloud covered the mountain for six days. On the seventh day, God called to Moses out of the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of Yahweh looked like an all-consuming fire at the top of the mountain. Moses climbed the mountain until he disappeared into the cloud and stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights. May God bless the hearing of these sacred words.
please rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Matthew's gospel, chapter 26, verses 20 and 25 through 30, taken from the Inclusive Bible. When it grew dark, he reclined at table with the twelve. Then Judas, who was betraying Jesus, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said it yourself. During the meal, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples. Take this and eat it, Jesus said. This is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them. Drink from it, all of you, he said. This is my blood, the blood of the covenant, which will be poured out on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. The truth is, I will not drink this fruit of the vine again until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Abba's kingdom. Then, after singing the hollow, they walked out to the Mount of Olives. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Come to prayer with me this day. Gracious, loving God, you are the one who is the one that shows us what love is. And you remind us that love must be our greatest gift by reminding us to remember without love, our words don't matter and our knowledge will be empty. We thank you this day that your love is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit and through the gift that you give us each and every day. So I ask now that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day, and the words that come from my mouth, along with the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, be they ever acceptable to you, in Christ we pray, amen. So this morning we conclude our three-week series that we've titled, Love Talks. And we've been talking about love within the Bible, and those who were probably considered to be on the outskirts of acceptability by the populace of the populace people. And Jesus was also one of those who was out there seeking them to show that radical, inclusive love. But also when Jesus was asked to sum up the entire gospel and through all of his teaching, he summed it up by saying, love God, love people which is the core of everything that we believe in. And there are times that we get so used to talking about love that it sometimes loses its power, loses its significance. But in reality, it's life changing. And when you encounter and experience the love of God, it changes how you live. It changes how you treat people. But we only experience it when we grasp on that radical love that God provides because we know that it will definitely change us. This morning we're going to talk about one of the villains in Scripture. And everyone loves a good villain, especially when it comes to those action-packed movies. And we know that every good movie needs a villain. And you know, you have to have a good villain because... They are so realistic and disliked. And the ones that you just can't stand ultimately in most stories, but you always need that bad guy. Stories need drama. Not that we don't have enough drama in our lives, 
but some of it needs that type of a villain so you can move it forward and every movie box office thriller moves that narrative forward because what a good move without a good movie without conflict it sometimes then forces the main character to overcome and adapt which ultimately makes the villain's character captivating i mean if you look at the characters in batman dating ourselves a little bit if you remember that far back that the joker was more interesting to many than batman and the villains despite their flaws are easy to hate through their action but most certainly they captured your attention and within Jesus' story the one story that uh, would say would be the top of the list would be the judas story and the name judas sends shivers down some folks back when they hear it and if you don't remember who judas was in all of this let me give you the spoiler alert jesus was the one Judas was the one who betrayed Jesus. And if we can recall the story, Judas was the one who sold out Jesus, which ultimately led to his death, which led to the crucifixion, which ultimately led to the torture. But keep in mind that Judas was actually in that inner circle of all things. If you didn't know, Jesus, Judas was one of Jesus' best friends but ended up turning his back on Jesus and stabbing him in the back, so to speak. Judas is the villain here in our story. So we pretty much heard the story through our gospel lesson this morning, the hero confronting Ju Jesus, the hero confronting Judas, the villain. But Jesus was literally calling out Judas from all the others as we heard in the gospel lesson. But Jesus was actually being put on the spot right there in public. I mean, how many of us have ever been called on the carpet, so to speak? Not always a good feeling, right? And ironically, this is a story of a call-out story because here Jesus is calling out Jesus, Judas even before Judas did what he was going to do to betray Jesus. Basically, preempting this by calling him out. Here Jesus is dropping this bomb right in the middle of dinner with his friends. Jesus looks directly at Judas and says to, to them that you will be the one that will betray me. And we have to assume at this point that Judas has already got things in motion and has contacted the authorities on his venture to betray Jesus, in which meaning that he hasn't done anything yet, but definitely can assume that he's got things in motion. But Jesus looks at, looks at Judas right in the eye and says that one of you here is going to betray me. And of course, at this point, the air has probably gotten sucked out of the room like a vacuum. And Jesus' entire team was pretty much who dedicated to him. They all sat there. I think they were in this moment of terror, shock. I, I don't think there was someone from there that didn't bat an eye. This just wasn't someone out there from Jerusalem, but a traitor at the table, a traitor in the room, sending the shock waves out into the atmosphere to everyone at presence. And of course, this exchange takes place of all times during the Last Supper with the Twelve Disciples. Now we've all seen the famous portrait painting of the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. And if you haven't, I forgot to bring it this morning to show you, but imagine it in your, in your heads if you all know that picture. But it's called the Last Supper for a reason. This was the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples before he was arrested and crucified. And as we said all along, he was arrested at, on this hot tip that the authorities had gotten from this guy named Judas, someone who was sitting right there at the table, not too far from where Jesus was sitting. Now, this moment is probably full of emotions, full of drama, 
and the painting is can probably considered one of the best works of Renaissance arts going and one of the best paintings that da Vinci has ever done to accomplish. He did something that very few artists did back in that time because most painters and artists back in that time of Jesus approached the story with quiet, reflective, with holy scenes in their minds. Yet da Vinci captures the emotion when he painted this picture. This painting depicts the moment when Jesus is telling the table that someone is about to betray him and that he was going to die. The painting depicts, 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 excuse me, I can't get words out this morning. My for apologies. It depicts 12 friends who worked together, who traveled together, who slept in the same campsite for three years and now suddenly discover that two of them, yes, there was two, that are going to turn their backs on Jesus. And we know that one of them was turning Jesus over to be murdered. And this was the moment that da Vinci captured. And he depicts that fear, that anger, and that compassion in that entire painting. <coughs> you have to take a moment to look at the characters surrounding Jesus. Some of them are whispering to one another, also pointing fingers and making gestures of, of what they were just slapped in the face with. <coughs> and if you look at the picture and look to the far left, there's Judas, the betrayer, sitting there, shadowed and surrounded by his friends. And after all the chaos is reclining as they did that day, Jesus now, then, continues on and leads them through the Passover meal. Well, we all know that Passover is one of the most sacred holidays in the Jewish culture. So this was not just your Sunday dinner at Grandma's house. It was a very intimate experience. Even after the show-stopping statement that Jesus made, that Judas, you're going to betray me, the meal still carried on. Jesus still pastored his friends. Jesus still broke the bread and gave them some wine, and they still had an evening together. I guess you could just call it boys' night out. Jesus drops the bomb and continues eating with his buddies. He pours each of them a glass of wine. He shares a loaf of bread with them. And through this, they are probably recovering from their grief, recovering from the shock. But it was somewhat back to business as normal, laughing and singing as they celebrated this religious ceremony. One can be obsessed with this dinner and drama, but this exchange is about to be more than just a kinship. It's about this inclusive and this radical love of Jesus. This exchange is so much more than the bomb that Jesus had just laid on them. But it was about the love that Jesus had for each of these disciples. So what does Jesus do when he's confronted with direct opposition from his friends? He kept eating with them and this, though, should probably be a moment for reflection. We all love people who like us. And surely we love people who love us. And surely we strive to love people we even dislike. But what about those people who actually hurt us? What about those people who sin against us? What about those people who turn their backs on us? that spread a lie about you, that hurt you and betray you, that you turn you over to the authorities for a measly 30 pieces of silver, what happens then? What do any of us do in those moments? I saw a commentary not too long ago from a pastor who made this comment that Jesus knew what was going to happen but Judas still ate. I mean, that's a powerful statement if you think about it. Jesus knew, but Judas ate.
Jesus knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew what was going to happen and still had a meal with Judas. Jesus went into this supper knowing that this betrayal was coming, knowing that everything was about to happen bad, all because a tip from a friend. But yet Jesus sat down and still shared a meal with everyone. Jesus knew that Judas's actions would ultimately lead to his feet and his hands having nails driven through them. But he still sat down and had dinner with Judas. Judas would turn his back, but Jesus would still have open arms. This is the overwhelming, inconceivable, incomprehensive love of Jesus on display. You could probably imagine that most of us would have thrown Jesus down the stairs, refused to serve him dinner, or possibly hurt Judas before their friends got to them first. Yet Jesus, yet Judas, was still invited to the table by Jesus. And we can understand loving someone who loves us back, but Jesus loves someone who turned him in to the authorities. But we should be thankful for Judas, and we should be thankful that Judas ate, because it gives us hope. I think it also does that because we all have a bit of Judas within us. Whether we like it or not, we all have a little bit. We have tendencies within us to rebel or even betray God's plan for us. We can be unloving. We can be ungrateful. We can be unfaithful to Jesus. We can hurt people. We can hurt ourselves. We can all fall into ways and habits that pull us away from Jesus and God's plan for each of us. But take a look at the story. The story doesn't stop God from loving us. And if it didn't stop Jesus from loving Judas, it definitely doesn't stop God and Jesus from continuing to love us. So we end this series knowing that there is room at the table for everyone. There was room at the table for Judas, and there's room at the table for each of us. No matter what we've done, no matter what mistakes we've made, no matter what guilt we may have in our lives, there is still room at that table for each and every one of us. This is that inclusive and radical love of Jesus. So as we prepare and begin this Lenten season, as we prepare our journey to the cross, let us continue to know that there will always be room at the table for you and for me. Blessings upon each and every one of you this morning. Amen. Good morning and welcome to all of you worshiping with us, whether you're in here in person or online. On behalf of the board and the leadership, I want to say thank you for joining us. If you're here in person, I want to remind you to fill out your green Keeping in Touch card, your name on the front so we know you're here, and any prayer requests or updates on the back, so that I can update the prayer chain that goes out on Wednesday. For those of you online, give us a like, send a comment, put a comment in the field, let us know you're worshiping with us. And if you'd like to put in a requ prayer request, go to our website, and you should be able to send an email to us with that prayer request as well. We, uh, we thank you for all of your offerings and your tithes and your donations. We depend on you, we love you for it, we're so appreciative. And anything you give, please know, we will use to, to further this church's mission and to help keep this church alive. As Reverend Tory mentioned today and in his, uh, the Church Weekly that came out on Friday, starting Wednesday on Ash Wednesday begins our 40-day Lenten Challenge. It ends on Palm Sunday. Now, my background is Lutheran growing up. And so we were always told, well, you need to give something up for Lent. And whatever you give up and don't buy, whether it's ice cream or candy or coffee, you put the money in your little Lenten basket and you turn it into the church so that it can be put towards God's work in this world. Now, I know some people don't like to give up things. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. So in that case, as Reverend Tory also mentioned in the Church Weekly, maybe it means 
giving up a little bit more of your time to do something for someone else, or spend time in prayer, or paying something forward in this world to make life better for others. However you do it, whether you give something up, whether you spend a little extra time doing something, I ask and I pray and I hope that you'll put something aside to give to the church for your Lenten challenge. It's a way of giving back to God. It's a way of helping this community. And we have so many things that need to be fixed in the church building that that's probably what we're going to put the funds towards, is to help do some repairs on the building. In any event, I wish you a blessed Lent, Lenten season. I hope you'll do that journey with Jesus to the cross and that it will mean something to you. And please continue. Worship with us every Sunday through this Lenten season. Amen. As we come to the table this morning, as I mentioned in my message this morning, that we are all welcomed at this table. Will you pray with me? We could build grand edifices crafted out on our opinions of how you should act and be. O oh God of mountains, or we could gather up all the broken dreams of the most vulnerable to build a most just world. We could join in the choruses which ridicules all who have been pushed aside by those climbing to the top. Or we could hear songs of reconciliation of hope in the words of all that we seek through peace. We should avert our gaze from those who have fingers pointed at them because of where they come from. Spirit of love, who we are not, or we could catch a glimpse of you coming down from the closest shelf of where we put you to be with us. But when we could stay on the mountaintops, take us by the hand and lead us into a service, God of community, holy and one, as we pray, as we have been taught, as Jesus taught us, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy dominion come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the dominion, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May the God of each dawn be with each of you. And also with you. Let us open our hearts to God who gathers us at the table. May, the light and grace which fills our lives. May we offer our praise to the one who calls us beloved. We give thanks to our God of holiness. You took the shards and chaos, repairer of all brokenness, and transfigured them into the mountains where we could draw closer to you. Valleys where we could serve your people, bright stars of each morning. These gifts and so many more we offered to the children of the dust that you call beloved. But we joined death and sin in their conspiracy to make themselves more important than you in our lives. You waited for us to return to you, sending invitation after invitation to people of every age. But we continued to plot listening only to sin's foolish words. When you could no longer wait, you sent Jesus to us so we might take shelter in you. With those who have seen your glory, with those who hunger for your grace, we join as we sing in praising your name.
gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts you provide of the bread and the fruit of the vine. Let the bread we break and the cup we bless speak to us of the presence of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us within the living Christ and with all who follow Christ's way, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. On that night that Jesus was betrayed and taken from us as he gathered with disciples, taking bread from the table, giving thanks, blessing it, and saying to take and to eat, as this is my body given for you, and that each time you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, following the meal, Jesus took the cup from the table. He blessed it and said that this is the cup of the new covenant of my life, which is poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Drink from this often, and when you do, do so in remembrance of me. Will you pray with me? Here in this place, with your people, you set before us the blessing of the cup and of the bread, pouring out your spirit on your children and on your feast. As we eat the brokenness which makes us whole, we will choose to follow your ways into the streets of the worlds to bring justice and hope to all who have been put to shame. As we drink from the cup of life, we will choose to be servants working together to bring reconciliation and peace to all shattered by violence. And when you choose to bring time to a close, when you choose to gather around us, you will join our siblings from every time and every place who will forever sing your praises within the upright hearts, God in community, holy and one. Amen. Join us for brunch after worship at Central. Come have pancakes and beignets to celebrate Mardi Gras, um, but uh, join us. So now as we go out into the world this day and each and every day, let us go out into the world through God's tender mercies and love and protection that is given to each and every one of us. As we know it given to us through God the Creator, God the Savior, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. I invite you to sit for the person. <laughs>